Hello everybody and welcome to the wine cast. This is another brief cast, but instead of focusing on a great variety, I thought I'd spend a little time talking about a favorite wine style of mine, the Basque Country's Chacolina, a bright, versatile wine that's become something of an it wine on the bistro and small plate circuit, and that deserves a closer look. Before we talk about the particulars of this wine, though, let's get some basic issues of nomenclature out of the way. First, though you'll hear it referred to as Chacoli, sometimes spelled slightly differently but pronounced identically in Castilian, this spelling and pronunciation are considered a mistake by the folks that weigh in on the rules of Basque grammar. Instead, the root form of this name is Chacolin, and the proper form to use when referring to this wine is Chacolina, with the A at the end of the word being a suffix that represents the definite article, or the word the, in Basque. Which of these three should you use? You'll actually hear all three of them used, though with a definite preference for either Chacolina or Chacolí, and of those two, Chacolí being the one that has the widest currency. So, you decide. As for the origin of the word itself, that's unknown, with even its place of origin, which is usually assumed to be the Basque country, uncertain, with both Spanish and French language origins suggested, but still unproven for the word. Speaking of place of origin, Chacolina, which is a regional style and not a grape, is made in the Basque country on Spain's northern Atlantic coast. Within that region, it's produced in three DOs, or denominaciones de origen. Getariajo, or in Spanish, Getaria, re represented by the area labeled number 18 on the map. Vizcaico, or Vizcaya, represented by number 17, along with a small exclave removed from the main appellation and Arbaco, or Alava, number 16 on the map. Though climate will vary slightly from vineyard site to vineyard site, on the whole the region has a cool maritime climate that has a big influence on how grapes ripen in the area and on the sorts of wines that can be made from them. And speaking of grapes, the most important one of the half dozen or so approved for use in these appellations is Ondarabi Zuri which, along with the other grapes we're about to cover, you'll see spelled in a wide variety of ways. Ondarabi Zuri is a white grape that's at the core of white wine production, which represents about 95% of total production in the region. Ondarabi Belza, a red variety, drives red and rosé production, which is comparatively rare and largely limited to the Biscaico Chacolina D.O. Reds are made exclusively of Belza, while rosés must contain at least 50% of that grape, with any slack being taken up by whites. And though Zuri and Belza mean white and black, respectively, they aren't different color clones of the same variety, like Pinot Blanc and Pinot Noir, for example, but in fact aren't related at all, and probably ended up with a similar-sounding moniker because both were planted around a Basque town with that name. Speaking of relationships between grapes, it's worth saying a word about a misidentification that you'll hear very frequently between this grape and the American hybrid grape, Noah. In a really brilliant couple of posts on his now dormant blog, Fringe Wine, that I'll link to in the description, curator Rob Tabot showed how the source of the misidentification seems to have been that during the phylloxera crisis of the late 19th century, cuttings of Noah were planted in the area because of their resistance to that pest, and these hybrid vines somehow got the name Hondarabi Zuri attached to them, perhaps because of a similarity in appearance, since they don't taste very much like each other at all, with Noah showing that famous musky quality that everyone calls foxiness. Be that as it may, though, most of these Noah plantings were pulled up after grafting became the accepted solution to phylloxera. Some remained and continued to grow, though, under the Hondarabi Zuri name and were erroneously included in a sample used by grape genetics researchers in 2002 who thought they were analyzing the grape that went into Chacolina but were instead analyzing the hybrid Noah that was left over from Phylloxera. So the researcher's report identified the two grapes with each other and this claim was picked up by a number of sources including the usually reliable Oxford Companion to Wine and the misidentification between the two grapes spread from there. But as Rob Tabot also showed in his research, the grape called Hondarabi Zuri that goes into Chacolina should be identified with another grape, the cultivar known in France as Courbou Blanc, that's grown in Gascony in the southwest of France. Though most Chacolina is white and made from at least a majority of Hondarabi Zuri, white and rosé Chacolina can also contain other white grapes depending on the specific rules of each DO and including Hondarabi Zuri Zeratia or Petit Courbou, Iskiriota, or Gros Monseng, Iskiriota Chipia, or Petit Monseng, Bordelais Azuri, or Faux Blanche, Chori Mahatsa, or Sauvignon Blanc, and Riesling and Chardonnay. 
That was a lot of technical information about this wine, but what's it actually like to drink it? Well, the cool climate, along with the specific character of the grapes involved, helps produce wines made in a pretty consistent style across the three appellations that are high in acid, low in alcohol, characteristically have a touch of petillance or effervescence that was originally an unintended consequence of the cool weather slowing down or arresting fermentation, but that's now managed intentionally via temperature-controlled steel tank fermentation, and that are very dry. The whites will show citrus notes along with some tart stone fruit like nectarine, and this core of fruit will be backed up by mineral, herb, and saline notes. Rosés and reds will also have citrus and herbs, as well as some mineral qualities, but thanks to the Onderabi Belza, will also bring some bright red fruit like strawberry and raspberry to the table. And the herbal notes in these non-white wines will sometimes be perceived as rhubarb thanks to the interplay between the red fruit, particularly the strawberry, and the herbs. These wines are extraordinarily food-friendly, and thanks to their low alcohol, effervescence, and light body, fun and easy to drink. They pair very well with tapas, or as they're called in Basque country, pinchtos, especially those that foreground big, bold flavors like the hildas pictured here that combine anchovies, olives, and pickled chilies. And, fun fact, thanks to its bone-dry character, chacolina is considered a fantastic pairing for artichokes. Why? Because artichokes contain a chemical called cynarin that makes anything else you might consume, including wine, taste sweeter than it is. So a bone-dry chacolina is just the ticket to get your palate back into sorts after some artichokes and drawn butter, or however else you like to eat them. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. Chocolina is actually a real favorite of mine, and when I get a chance to try one, I usually jump on it. So I hope this cast leaves you feeling like you'd like to do the same, and feeling more comfortable and open to ordering or buying some when you get the opportunity. As always, if this cast was helpful and enjoyable to you, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And I want to say a special thank you to a number of my subscribers and followers who've been kind enough to mention me and my casts on sites like Reddit and other internet forums. I want these casts to be as helpful as possible to as many people as possible, so thanks for helping me get the word out about them, and please keep letting others know about them. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.